Well, uh, thanks for coming, everyone. My name is Jim Robinson, and I run a, uh, a small uh, SEO company called ClickSeed. It's very small. It's just me. Uh, I started it in January, uh, and I'm fortunate enough to, I come from uh, NASDAQ. I worked at NASDAQ as a product director on NASDAQ.com, and so fortunate enough to maintain that relationship. And then recently, I also started working with a company called Winter Media, who uh, they, they own Rolling Stone and Us Weekly and Men's Journal. So I've got some really great clients. Things are off to a great start. And uh, I'm hoping to share a little bit of, of what I do with those guys, but also uh, make this kind of specific to uh, small businesses and startups and things that might uh, be more appropriate for this area. Uh, so just a quick agenda. Um, what are people's main interests here? I, I have, you know, I, I've, I've got three basic sections I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk about on-page SEO, which is uh, the stuff that a lot of people think about, like your keywords and putting it in your, you know, your meta tags and on the page and stuff like that. So I've got a section on that. Uh, then I'm going to talk about social media and how that uh, works with SEO. And then I'm also going to talk about local SEO a little bit. Is there any one of those that kind of stands out to you guys? So all of it sounds good? OK. Um, I might skip over certain sections. We've got a lot to cover here. So why don't I just go through it? Um, I think I've talked about the three things there. And at the end, uh, I'll give you a couple of uh, sort of foundational keys to ranking well in search. So what is SEO? Uh, I think most people, if you're coming to this event, you're probably at least familiar with it, but uh, the basic idea is that, you know, I pretty much focus on Google. They have uh, the vast majority of market share in search. And um, so when you do a search, you see these, uh, the results down, the free results or organic results that are down in the main content area, and they're usually surrounded by uh, paid results, which are which seem to keep expanding. When I search Google now, like the organic results are down at, I have to scroll down to even see them in some cases. But this is the idea. So SEO is focusing on this green part here. And why is this important? Um, last August, Google announced that they were serving 3 billion searches a day. So um, when I started at, as uh, in-house SEO at NASDAQ back in 2007, I, I felt at that time, I was like, you know, I think this has really peaked. And it was around that time we started seeing people publishing articles like, you know, SEO is dead and it's all about social media and stuff like that. And this is what ha has happened with search since that time. And, it, and there's no uh, sign of it slowing down anytime soon. Another interesting thing about search. Um, if you look at the share of, of total internet traffic from back in 2003, you see that search was really dominant, 70% of the uh, share of traffic. Uh, and we have something else that's come into play in, in 2013, social media. But the thing about this is it's not a zero-sum game. If you look at this chart down here, this is it's hard to read, but these are plots of developed world the world globally and the developing world. And you can see in all three cases, the internet continues to grow. So although social is taking a larger percentage of the market share, it has not taken away from search. Search has actually grown. Another interesting thing about search is it's high quality traffic. Uh, and your audience is initiating the search in this case. You know, it, they're not being interrupted. Uh, and and it's not passive either. Social media is a little bit more passive. You're, you're seeing stuff appear in the stream. In this case, people are looking for stuff. You, as, a, as an owner of a website, you're able to create content that targets specific places in the buy cycle. Or if you think in terms of a conversion funnel, you can create content that targets keywords that are indicative of somebody who's about to buy something. And that's a really powerful aspect of search. And that's why it has the highest lead to close rate of any of the channels. Does that make sense to everybody when I talk about lead to close? Yes. Can I ask a question? When you say social media, are you talking about ads on social media, or are you talking about people referring companies privately, or what, which thing do you 
I would say all of the above, because when you, when you separate out social media, I think the main thing we're talking about is likes and shares and, and things like that. So it's the more sort of organic active social activity that's taking place. But there's also native advertising that's taking place in social channels, uh, such as promoted tweets and you know, uh, paid posts and stuff like that in Facebook. So it could be paid as well. And then, you know, something to keep in mind about SEO, at least, you know, different companies do this in, in different ways. And the way I do it, uh, I have a technical background. My degree is in electrical engineering. I've done a lot of programming and stuff. Uh, so the way I look at SEO is that it's, it's taking all of the tactical elements that are involved with making a great website and making sure that they're all done in such a way that it increases your visibility in search. Uh, a lot of times people... Um, you, you know, I, I feel like I'm kind of a hybrid marketer slash technical person. And uh, I think any good SEO, if you hire them, they're going to suggest probably some technical changes to your, to your site. For that reason, it's something that, that you should be thinking about. I've, I've talked to a lot of people, uh, a lot of clients who um, have just built a website that's not performing well in search, and so they go to hire an SEO guy probably not the best time to be thinking about that. The best time to be thinking about it is at the very beginning. And this is where, you know, uh, a lot of uh, web developers are becoming much more SEO savvy. We, ha we have people here today who are web developers interested in search, and that's great. Um, but if you're working with somebody who's maybe a great designer, doesn't know as much about search, it would be worthwhile to have any of the do kind of an audit of the design documents and, and have a SEO sort of weigh in at that point before you build something that may not perform well in search. So the first major area I'm going to talk about is, is just basic on-page optimization. And this is typically what people think of when they're thinking SEO. This is, a, uh, this is an old... Uh, image from SEO Moz, and it sort of it illustrates the basic concept that you're going for here. Uh, you are, you're targeting a keyword in the page, and you're making sure that keyword appears in all these various elements of the page. Now, this is kind of, you know, this is kind of old, this approach. It, 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 you used to just be able to do this and rank really, really well, and the basic con, uh, concept still applies, but this is kind of simplistic at this point. The reason I show this is um, I think when you're creating content, you need to, maybe not while you're writing it, but early in that process, before you publish it, you need to be thinking about how users are going to find this content. And so you want to have a target keyword in mind. So this kind of illustrates that. You know, when somebody's writing content for the web, um, you you really have to think about, somebody might write, like in this example, Acme Interactive is pleased to present our amazing and cost efficient, you know, you've already lost somebody at that point. And that's not how they're gonna search for it. So you really wanna align the way you create and publish your content, uh, anticipating how users will actually perform a search for that content. Does that make sense? And then here are a couple uh, keyword tools. The, the big one is the, the free AdWords keyword tool. If you type in keyword tool in Google, that'll be the first result you get. Um, I've been seeing a message on there lately that says this tool is, is going away, the free version of the tool, and it's going to become part of uh, AdWords. Now, you can create an AdWords account and not fund it. AdWords is, is Google's uh, product. Remember when, when I showed the ads on the top and on the side? That's where you go to pay for those kind of ads. Uh, so they're going to incorporate it into that tool, so you'll need an account. Another tool I use is Google Trends. And Trends is interesting because you can see keyword volume over time. And you can kind of do a, you can put up to four keywords in there. So you can kind of do a bake off. If you're not quite sure which variation of your keyword gets higher volume, you can put it in there and make sure that you're incorporating the higher volume keyword. Uh, another thing I do is I go into Google and just use their auto-suggest feature. That's a great way. I mean, presumably, when you type in a search and you see some suggestions there, those are very common search phrases. Um, so there's a tool called Ubersuggest, 
and if you type your keyword in, in Uber Suggest, it'll actually automate that process for you. It'll show everything in the uh, auto suggest for each letter of the alphabet. So it, it's still pulling from Google, but it sort of automates that process, and you can get a ton, ton of great uh, keyword ideas from there. The most important on-page element, when I talk about on-page element, this, you've created a web page, you have all these different elements, you've got your title, your heading, your, the body, and all this. Out of all of those, the, the title, the HTML title, or what some people call the meta title, is probably the most important thing to have optimized. Um, when you write your titles, you want to be very literal, uh, specific to the page. You don't want to carry, you don't want to have a whole bunch of pages that start off with the same keywords that are, you know, very similar titles. You want your titles to be very unique to the page and incorporate your keywords, preferably near the beginning of the title tag. If you're targeting a keyword, you want to have those at the beginning. And use full proper nouns when you write somebody's name, actually write out their whole name or the name of a place. Um, rule of thumb, uh, the limit here is, is approximately 70 characters over to this point. It's, but it's not character based, it's, it's a pixel width, so it, it varies depending on the letters. But if you exceed that, it's just going to cut it off. There's not necessarily a penalty for going over, it's just going to get cut off. Um, yep, and that's it for the title tag. So the meta description. This is something that you don't see on the page. And if you're using a content management system, there should be a field that says description or something like that. Or if you actually work in the code, um, this would be one of the keywords that's up in the top of the web page that says meta description. And that's used to generate the snippet and search. That's the main place it will appear. So if you want it, Google can pull content from the page and from other places as well to use as the snippet. So if you want to make sure that it gets used, you want to make sure you re repeat your keyword in the meta description as well. Now, the meta description is not part of the ranking algorithm. If you put keywords in there, it's not going to make any difference where you rank. But what it will do is based on the quality of your meta description, how compelling it is, it'll affect how many people actually click through on your result. So I suggest using compelling language here to, to really kind of sell your content. And a best practice here is, uh, you know, around 150 characters. And again, if you go longer than that, it's just going to get cut off. So if you're really, you know, I see people who are like, ah, but I really want to get this keyword in there. It's, it's just going to get cut off. So there's no penalty there, but it's kind of a waste of time. Then when you go to uh, work in the p visible part of the page, you have uh, your page headings. Usually that's in an H1 tag. Heading tags are like H1, H2, H3. And they generally correspond to, you know, if you write an outline for your content, then the main title would be in an H1 and subheadings would go down from there. The H1 is, is kind of a special element in that there should only be one H1 on the page. The other head elements you can repeat. Now, a lot of SEOs don't think that um, these H tags really have any bearing on ranking anymore. They, they, they used to, and I think that's been minimized. Um, if you happen to be a, any, like a news publisher and you're in Google News, the H1 is extremely important because that's what they use to display the headline. I showed you in the other results how it uses the title tag to actually display your search result in the Google results. In Google News, they're actually using your headline in their results, so it's a little different. So I do encourage you to always use the H1. And then, you know, break up your sections and incorporate your keywords into those subheading tags, too. Make sense? In the body of your, your content, um, this actually looks like a heading. The previous one was like the major heading, and this is sort of like a subheading. So this is moving down into the body. They've repeated uh, this keyword of, of internet marketing. And, uh, and then down in, early in the content, uh, they have internet marketing again. So this isn't something where you, know, you want to just repeat your keyword a whole bunch of times. However, uh, I would make sure that somewhere in your document there is an exact match of the keyword you're targeting 
and the earlier in the content, the better. Uh, you want to make sure you write a minimum of 100 words. Longer content's better. About 250 words is what you should be shooting for. Uh, be keyword rich, descriptive, detailed. Put all the details in your content because you never know where that's going to get picked up in, in search. Does anyone ever notice that when you type in a search, you see Wikipedia results? Yeah. <laughs> so a big part of that is you know, the design of the site. They really emphasize their internal linking. And they're pretty stingy about their external linking. They, they put those down at the bottom, and they put a little tag on there so that it doesn't pass link value. But all of this internal linking to other pages and the text that's actually linked is what helps those other pages on their site link. So when you're creating content and you created uh, some other piece of content that relates to it, don't be afraid to be very self-referential. You know, like refer back to all of your previous content and, and link keywords that, uh, that might help that previous content. Do you have a question? I do. Yep. <laughs> okay, you might touch on this later, but <clears throat> I was always under the impression that you can keyword too much. Yeah. So at what point have you keyworded too much? I, the rule of thumb is to put the user first. Um, I mean, that you, you can do that. You can over-optimize. You say donut, 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 chocolate, donut, chocolate, donut. And then at some point, you're going to say, OK, you're spamming the keyword. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So I mean, you want it to be able to stand up to a human review. It, it's it's art and science. I yeah. mean, there, there's no particular number, but flow naturally, right? yeah. yeah. And what I normally do is when I write my content, I just I write it and I'm I'm not really thinking about that. But then I go back and read through my content and I look for just a couple places where I can kind of nudge in my, my keyword and exact match on my keyword. And um, and you know, keep in mind this is best practice. But this is not going to make or break your rankings. Like all of this on-page stuff is generally, you know, it's just one slice of the pie. You can rank a web page that has no content on it if it has enough of the right links pointing into it. It might just be an image. And if, it, if you have all, everything else firing on all cylinders, you could rank that piece of content. So, so how important is back in the code part, not the, what you see, I have my clients come up with a list of their keywords. And sometimes with doing that, they repeat words over and over, trying to cover all the bases of what somebody could. And at one point, is, is that is that important? Those keyword tags that you put in the code or not? Um, what What do you mean when you say keyword tags? Well, meta tags. Meta tags. I mean, there is a keyword meta tag, which, right. which is completely irrelevant now. Oh, it is? Okay, then yeah. that's mostly uh, Yeah, I don't even bother using that because okay. uh, it, was, it was spam. People spam that so much that search engines just stopped using it. Okay. There is a new tag called, the, it's the news keyword tag, and it does work in Google News, but for most people, that, that doesn't apply. Okay, that's Thank you so much. Yep. Um, I always like to suggest that you include images. Uh, aside from making the content more engaging, it gives you uh, another out page element to, to optimize and, and you know, sort of build out like what this page is about. Uh, it also, you can get some traffic from Google image search. You used to be able to get a lot more. They changed the interface in January. It's not sending nearly as much traffic to people's websites, but uh, it's still a good source of traffic. Um, so, Search engines like Square Images, social media sites like Square Images too, because if you notice when they show those little previews, a lot of times they crop the image or, or they make it small. So it's a good idea to keep them square. And images have something called an alt attribute. Uh, you, you actually put it in the code. And uh, that should be a very short description of what you see in the picture. And if you can get it to work out to where that includes your keyword, it's another good spot to, to put that. But, but don't keyword stuff. Search engines like score pictures. If you look in the results, you know, it's just it's how they format their results. And I think that when you, you know, if you, if you just look at the photos they use, Google News is a, 
is a great site to look at it if you, if you want to see a bunch of examples of how Google is automatically cropping images and pulling them in because they have all square images. If you don't include an image um, with your content, they'll actually take an image from someone else's site and, and put that next to your content because they realize the images make the headlines much more engaging. Is it, does it help you if you add more information to the alt tag? Because I sometimes have been putting my name and address or business name or whatever. I would say, you know, Frederick Maryland, picture of Frederick Maryland in, and then the business name. Do you get any benefit from doing that? I would say yes if it applies to that picture. I mean, the way I kind of think of that is that is the content that goes along with, you know, a, a photo is a linkable asset. And so if that asset appears in Google image search, you want some information around it to explain what that is. Okay. But I wouldn't stuff keywords in there that aren't relevant to that image. And I wouldn't put like a paragraph or something in there. I would just, you know, keep it pretty. Keep pity on the people that are visually impaired and are using screen readers. Okay. Oh. Yeah, and I, and I should have mentioned, it's kind of, it's kind of rude of me not to mention that. That's actually what the alt tag is for, to, to help people who are visually impaired. To, yeah, and so if they're seeing that, then you're really spamming them, and you know, so. Uh, Yep. If you want to be the fun, but I just want to offer that up as, as a means of giving you all these great slides. Okay. Where are we on time? You've got 35 more minutes. Okay, good. Um, yeah, and, and so you asked a question that this sort of addresses. I mean, yeah, basically you want to re repeat your keywords in each element. That's the basic idea. But don't do it in a way that makes it sound like a robot. Like, just try to, try to do it... Uh, in a clever way that, that reads well for the user. So this next section, external signals, this is about in, inbound links in social media. And these external signals are actually quite a bit more powerful than anything that you're going to do on the page. Uh, going back to the previous section, I, if you just did one thing right, I would say get that title tag right and write good content. To just, you know, and you're, you'll be good to go. Because that will then result in you getting a lot of these external signals. Um, you can, you can kind of help some of these external signals along, but, but ultimately it's going to be other people's opinion of your content, which is why they're weighted a little bit more heavily. So the main external signals are inbound links, and uh, especially when they use your, your target keywords in the anchor text. This, is, this underlined part is called the anchor text, and the keywords that are in that part are very important. Um, now, a lot of people knowing this would, would buy uh, links and, and even in their site use the same keywords over and over again. Um, Matt Cutts is the head of quality at, at, at search quality at Google, and uh, he's indicated that doing that on your site isn't that isn't that bad. You can actually, it's almost like a navigational feature. So it's not that bad to use the same anchor text to point to the same piece of content. But if they look from the outside and they see that every website on the internet that points to this page is using the exact same anchor text, that doesn't look natural. That looks like you've tried to manipulate the algorithm and they'll penalize you for that. So I don't suggest engaging in buying these kind of links, although they are very important. Uh, and then social signals. These are the, the, the likes, the plus ones, the tweets, and all that stuff from uh, the major social networks. So like I said, get lots of links. Links are the currency of the web. And, and some people would say they're the soul of the web because what makes it the web is all of these interconnected pieces of information. So links are very important, and you want to get a lot of them. But you want to do it in a natural way. And one thing about PageRank, PageRank you might have heard of because this, is, this used to be like the most important component. It, it's really what made Google, Google. It, this was the special thing about, you know, they moved from uh, 
a keyword-based system where it was all about on-page text, and they moved to a more democratic system where uh, all of the links that point into your pages are, are like votes for your page. Uh, so this is not nearly as important as it used to be, but it's still a factor. Uh, so you get page rank. It's on a per-page basis. It's not just your overall site, although there is something called domain authority that's a little bit separate. But with page, page rank, it's per page. All the links point into your pages, and then you, in turn, share that page rank with your internal pages or external sites that you link to. And the most important thing here is, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. If you produce, and this is why blogging works, which I'll talk about in a minute, you blog and that becomes popular and a lot of people link into it, that page in turn will link to your other pages and help them as well. So I always say to preserve link equity. Anytime you have links pointing into your content, if you decide uh, I'm going to take this page down, I'm going to retire this page, or I'm going to do a redesign, it's going to change all of my URLs. Don't forget about all those URLs that are in Google's index that are, they need to go somewhere and you don't want them to go to a 404 page. You want to make sure that you capture any link value and transfer that over to the new pages. And that, to do that, you use something called a 301 redirect. It's just a, you're redirecting the page and sending a header response that has a certain code, which is a 301. Do you do that at your, the file manager to your domain uh, area, or do you do, do that with a, on the web page? You can do it on the web page if it's, a, if it's done in a dynamic language. Meaning, if you have a like a static HTML page, you can't you can't really put code in that page because there's nothing to understand what that code is. But if you make if you have like a PHP page or ASP or something like that, you can put the code in the page. Alternatively, you can do it at the server level. So you can if you're on uh, Mike, bless you. If you're on the Microsoft stack, you can do it in IIS. If you're using uh, PHP, you're probably running on Apache or something. And you can do it. Um, you can do it in something called an HT access file. You can put your redirects in there, and that's actually really easy. So there should be an app for that. I mean, I've been through all those apps, but I don't know what they're all for on the under the file manager. And some of them are for forwarding, and some of them are for redirects. But I really never use that. Yeah. It, th so most of them are, are going to have some something in there to address redirects. Okay. Uh, and there's something else called aliasing that's a little bit different. Uh, some people get confused about those two things, but, but redirects are just you're sending it to a new place with a certain header response. So how do you get links? Um, like I said, I mean, you can, you can go buy links, um, and people still do it a lot, and you can be sneaky about it and be under the radar and get away with it. But long term, I, I just think it's not a good investment of your time. Your time is much better spent creating really good content that, that does what ultimately you're trying to do, which is connect with your audience and accomplish whatever your business goals are. So a great way to do that is a, way, a great way to do link building, keeping in mind that a rising tide lifts all boats, is to do blogging. Uh, companies who blog get 97% more uh, inbound links to their websites. Yeah. In-depth content. This was a study from SEO Moz. They're actually, they're actually just called Moz now. Uh, but in-depth content gets more links. In their study, they studied a whole bunch of pieces of content and found that when the number of words was in this range, like 1,800 words to almost 3,000 words, this is what people link to the most. Um, maybe it's because it's really informative. I, I have this theory that when people are reading content that's, that's really good, uh, that people will use links almost like as a, almost like to bookmark it for later. I don't, I don't want to say bookmark, but they sort of get to a certain point in the content and they're like, wow, this is really good. I'm going to link to this piece of content. I don't even think they necessarily read it all. But I, for whatever reason, if the, the content is, is perceived as being extremely informative and detailed, people will want to link to it as a valuable resource. Another thing about from that same study, they found that including multiple different media formats in your content gets more links. 
uh, when you include an image, you always want to have text, um, but you have text along with an image and maybe you have an embedded video and uh, maybe some download of a PDF. You put all of this in one document, you've created some a really rich information resource that people are likely to link to. So the other big part of this is be social. Um, there are other people who work here at CoWork who probably give you great presentations on how to be social. And, uh, but from my standpoint, it's really about an opportunity to gen generate inbound links and, and signals from those websites. If, uh, if you have a whole bunch of links pointing into your site and there are no social signals around that, uh, I suspect that Google is going to start to say this is an unnatural link profile. If you've got all these links happening, because they're constantly trying to combat link spam. And uh, so I think one of the ways they're beginning to, to do that is, is to look at the social signals and make sure they're, they're comparable to the number of links that you're seeing. That's a little bit debatable. I, that's, that's my take on it, by the way. Are you saying that because it knows, for example, that someone from Facebook clicked on my link and went to my site? So somehow it knows that was a Facebook. Yeah, I mean. It, like, take uh, Twitter, for example. This is very anecdotal, but I've seen, I've seen this happen where I have one site I'm working with that's really powerful, like old site with you know, millions of visitors, and then a tiny site. And, uh, and the same content got published in both places. And 99% you know, of the time, on the big site, it's going to always outrank that small site. In one case, I saw the small site uh, it was exactly the same, but they tweeted on a major Twitter handle that, uh, that version of the article, and that one outranked the other one. It was, it's, I couldn't figure out for a while what the main difference was there, but it, it, it ended up being that. And it could be that um, tweeting it ended up generating some inbound links, and that's why it ranked. But I suspect you know, the data's out there, and Google has massive data storage capability, I mean, why, why wouldn't they take that into account? If they see something that's shared on a Twitter account that has a million followers, that should carry some weight. That should be an authoritative signal. I can see how they would be able to see that on Twitter since it's open to the public, but uh, I mean, not on Facebook, I mean. Yeah, unless it's posted, there's some stuff that's posted publicly, but you're yeah. right, I don't, I don't think that they have a lot of visibility into uh, Facebook which is going to lead me to another point in a minute, which is Google+. Plus. So, um, so, I mean, social signals. I mean, I think it's ultimately about getting backlinks. It, although I suspect there are direct uh, ranking implications, all, the, all that we know right now is that there's a correlation between social shares and links. And um, this was a study done by uh, Dan Zarella. He was at... Uh, he's at uh, HubSpot, I think he might have gone to, to Moz now too, I'm not sure. But he found that um, you would have thought that uh, Twitter or Facebook would have generated more links, but actually LinkedIn, there are more people on LinkedIn who I guess know how to link to your content. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, sharing your content on LinkedIn is, is pretty effective in terms of link building. In terms of link building? Yes. Um, and this, you know, for startups, I recommend, uh, there's a service called Noam, and there are probably a couple other ones like this. Uh, you could use one of those services if you have the money. If not, you could just spend some time. And I would try to secure your brand name. If you're putting any kind of effort into building a brand, I would make sure that you're securing that name in all of these different social networks. And it's hard to keep track of, which is why I suggest maybe using a service like this. But there's a side benefit of, you know, for, for ClickSeed, for, for my brand, if you do a Google search, uh, I, I own every result on the page. I mean, you type in ClickSeed, you're not going to find any other content. And, you know, I'm not using all of these, uh, these channels right now. But in my mind, they're sort of, you know, people slowly follow. They're starting to build up. This is a case where I don't necessarily practice what I preach, you know. I, like, it's my own site, so I haven't done a lot with this. But I still see value in having the accounts sort of uh, reserved for, for my use. And they do get into search and, and kind of uh, allow you to control 
all of the results on your brand. If your brand is your name, do you have any variation of your name? I don't think so. I mean, um, no. But there is there was is one point about name variation, which I'll mention in a minute, because I'm going to talk about uh, Google Plus. Do you think it's helpful to say you work for a really big company, like I work for Remax, mm -hmm. so I can't, it's not really my brand. Do you think that if you do work for a huge company like IBM or whatever, um, if you need to develop your own little like sub name that then becomes your unique brand somehow? Because obviously we're not owning that company name. Right. Yeah, and I think that uh, it's ultimately a, a decision of the marketing department how they want to do that. Um, you know, there's different, uh, there's like spoke and hub models and like all these different ways of like dis distributing how you're going to do that. Some people like to completely centralize that and then some people allow uh, people to kind of use the brand name uh, in sort of the root and then add on to that their name or, or location or whatever. So um, I think it's a marketing decision how that's handled. I'm working with one client right now who allowed all these different Twitter handles and stuff based on the brand and it sort of diluted the official channel. Yes. And so they're trying to pull all that back in now. Well, Facebook doesn't allow you to um, have a title that matches so you basically have to say John Smith at Remax Results. That's your that becomes your Facebook page. Right. It won't let you use the company name. Yeah. As your own business page. Yeah. Um, that makes sense, but you have to somehow adjust that name. Yeah. To get your own. And you know, from an optimization standpoint, uh, I would say it helps to have Remax in there to just uh, you know. As a, as a measure of trust so that people know you're legitimate, but um, you're probably never going to rank for Remax, so you're probably better off targeting your name anyway. So. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a watch. How much time do we have? Uh, you still have 20 minutes. Great. You're, you're great. Great. So I want to talk for a minute about um, Google Plus and authorship markup. Um, have you guys all seen this in, in Google results when somebody's picture appears next to the result? Yeah, so some studies have found that um, click-through rate can actually increase by about 40% or more. I've seen big numbers, like over 100%, by having a photo in there. And, you know, the reason is it, it makes the content more engaging. It, it also, uh, you know, makes you appear as a more credible resource, because this isn't just some random page that was generated by a machine. This is a person who's associating their name uh, with this content. And so for various reasons, as you can see, it, it increases uh, click-through rate. And it's a good idea, in order to do this, you need to create a connection between your web page and your Google account. And there's, they offer multiple options if you sign up to do that. Um, it'll step you through it. It's, it's pretty easy to do, but the main thing is on your page, you want to link to your Google profile and put a piece of code that, um, that it has like rel equals author, rel equals me. There's, there's different ways you can do it, but you put a little piece of code in there that says, hey, this is, this is my profile over on Google. And then in your Google profile, it has something that says you're a contributor to whatever, and you can put multiple publications in there. So if I was a writer for Rolling Stone, I could say that I'm a contributor to Rolling Stone, then link my content on rollingstone.com back to this profile, it would complete the cycle, and, uh, and then my photo would show up in results. So I assume that only works for Google Plus profiles and not Google Plus pages, like business pages? It can work for, um, there's a different setting called rel equals publisher. And if you put that on your home page, you, have you ever seen the knowledge graph results? When you do a Google search for something, it can appear over on the right side. Like if you do a, a lot of times a company name, if you search for Intel, you might see Intel's logo and some basic information on the right side. Um, they do that for brands as well. And that's a place where if you put rel publisher on your home page and you've sort of uh, verified your site, you can get that knowledge graph result, which gets you some additional real estate. 
Um, you asked before about variations of your name. And um, it's pretty important when you do this Google Plus markup, this authorship markup, when your name right here links back, uh, you know, like you might have a byline in your content. When that links over to your Google Plus profile, you want to make sure you're very consistent with the way you write your name. So if you use your middle initial in your content, make sure that you're using your middle initial on your Google Plus profile too. That's the one place where consistency kind of matters. And it's, you know, they'll probably overcome that right now, but it's still, you know, relatively early days for them. So um, things like that. There's a lot of little quirks, but be consistent with your name. And it's important not to use an ugly photo. The, this guy did an experiment, and he uploaded this photo, which just looks like he did it with his phone at, at home or something like that. And uh, his click-through rates actually went down because he, he looks like uh, an unreliable source. So if you're going to include your photo, get, get a professional headshot or something that, you know, it doesn't have to be all formal, but it should reflect your brand and, and what you're trying to say and who you're trying to reach. And then there's a lot of comparisons of, of Google Plus to uh, Facebook. And it's really not a good comparison because I think to some extent they want to be kind of like a Facebook. They want a lot of people to participate. But you've probably noticed if you're a Google user that um, this is come, becoming part of their global navigation. A any Google product that you're logging into, it's using the same authentication. It's kind of connected to this Google Plus account. So it's really, it, it, it's adding a social layer to Google's entire product portfolio. And for, from a publisher standpoint, if you publish content on the web, it's also like an author uh, identity verification system because you have to link your name to your site and all this stuff to get that. And Google has applied for uh, a patent quite a while ago uh, called, it's a patent, the patent name was for Agent Rank. And there's no evidence that this is out yet, but if you want to future-proof your site, it would be a good idea to get a Google Plus account and start getting people circling you and, and really becoming active in Google Plus. Uh, this is from uh, Eric Schmidt uh, from Google, and he says, within search results, information tied to verified online profiles will be ranked higher than the content without, without such verification. So, I mean, that, that sounds like a pretty big deal. And, and you know, this isn't something that I, I think is in the Google algorithm right now, but I think as they start to work through all these bugs and get more participation, it's going to start to really matter. So do you think that's sort of a, his push to get people to use Google Plus is sort of a threat? <laughs> it could be, but I also think it's, it's almost like a, it had to happen because this is what's happening in social media. You know, there's, there's, social proof that people look for. When a lot of people think something is great, that you're like, oh, OK, well, this must be great then, because everybody thinks it's great. And there are a lot of ways to measure that. There's tools like clout that are trying to, to measure your authority on a given topic and that kind of thing. So I think this is something that's happening anyway outside of Google. And this is Google's take on it and how, how it's going to be reflected in search results. So the next part I want to talk about is, is local SEO. And I'm sure if you've done a specific uh, local search query, you've probably seen this different type of result set. When you put a location in there, they refer to this as like a seven pack. Uh, there are seven results here, and they correspond. Uh, they show the pin locations on, on the map. Um, Obviously, local is, is very important for, for small businesses. And it, it's, an entire, it's not an entirely different ranking algorithm, but uh, all the other stuff that we just talked about is really only half of it. I mean, the, the, the links and the stuff on your website and everything else is only about half of this ranking algorithm. An entire other half of the algorithm is specific local ranking factors. Uh, and those are in two groups. The one is citations which is basically uh, references to your, uh, the name of your business and along with your address, which I'll explain more in a minute. 
And then reviews are also very important. When you get these reviews on uh, sites like Yelp and things like that, and especially if you get native reviews on, on Google, and Google Places, you can actually leave a review directly. Those carry a lot of, a lot of weight as well. So reviews are very important. But the citation thing is, is, uh, is interesting because it's similar to a link. It has the same, uh, in the algorithm, it's, it's sort of uh, synonymous with, with a link, but specific to local results. And they refer to this, the, the name of your business and, and your address and your phone number as a NAP, name, address, phone. And it's extremely important for your NAP to be consistent. Uh, anywhere where you get a business listing, if um, you know if you put suite 200 in one case and then you put number 200 in another, you just created two different addresses. Those are two different locations, and so uh, Google has a hard time. I mean, this is a machine trying to understand all this, so it has a hard time understanding that these are actually the same place and there are just different ways to write the same address. So be very consistent. You also don't, you know, if you're in a shared workspace, you don't want to have the same address that everyone else is using. You want to have some kind of a, a unique address that corresponds to your business. And when you submit uh, to all these directories and stuff that, that have your address, local business directories and things like that, you want to make sure that you remember where you've done that and what your passwords are. You don't want to lose access to these sites because if your address ever changes, it's very hard to go back and, and update that if you've lost your password, and it will affect your rankings. If you have an address change, uh, you, you could fall out of local results if suddenly there's all these different variations of your address. And I think uh, the, ultimately the most important place to show your address is on your website. I, if you have one business address, I suggest putting it in the footer uh, of your entire site. Um, if you have multiple, uh, addresses, I would suggest making dedicated pages for each of your locations. If you use a template, is that the same thing? Um, because that's what displays. A using a template with the address at the bottom, is that the same? Yeah. Yep. As long as the uh, you know, as long as when you view the source code of the page, it's actually there, uh, then that's that's fine. Um, and then one thing, you know, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I, was, I was talking to, to Glenn about this. Um, you know, this is a service that Cowork Frederick is now offering. If, if you are a member here, there's different uh, membership levels that you can talk to them about. But uh, Glenn worked this out uh, with the post office and everything so that now you can have a unique address at Cowork Frederick. So um, I, I highly recommend, you know, having unique, if you use a shared office space, don't have the same address as, you know, dozens of other businesses that are at that address. And then customer reviews. Um, like I said, the native Google Places reviews, those carry a lot of weight. I, I, would, I would suggest trying to do that. Um, definitely on Yelp, any of the review sites, get, get your listing on there with the consistent nap. Uh, it helps to have your keyword appear in the reviews, but you don't want to try to manipulate that. Um, you might maybe suggest to people how, you know, the type of review, have an example or something like that. And then another thing you can do is uh, Foursquare is one of the other things. I don't know if, you, if anyone uses Foursquare to check into locations, uh, but that check-in information can send additional signals. There's activity that actually occurs at this physical location. So I think the bottom line is that Google is looking for um, any information they can find that validates that this is indeed a real physical address and this business is actually here. And the more of those signals and the more of them that come from authoritative sources, the better. And just a couple tools that can help you uh, manage some of this. Um, one of them is Get Listed. This actually just got bought by, by Moz. And it's very helpful. It's a free tool where you there's a paid aspect to it, but you can use a free tool to go and see how you appear in the, uh, in the major directories to see if you've sort of covered your bases on, uh, on all the basic ones where you should have a listing. Uh, another one is Yext, and Yext is a, a service, I told you it's very important to keep track of your passwords. 
This is a service that actually manages this for you. It manages all of your listings. So if you ever want to change your address, um, you can manage it through that, and it'll help you to, to update that everywhere and kind of keep track of everywhere your address appears. And then there's a tool, uh, Local Citation Finder from WhiteSpark, and this will give you ideas if there are some uh, niche business directories where you could get a listing. That helps, too, in terms of relevance, and so this tool will uh, give you some, some good ideas to where to find those kind of listings. But these are all great, but you're busier than you can possibly keep up with right now, so obviously there's a point at which this is nice, but you really should hire um, you know, it, it just depends. I, I mean, if, you, if, if you've got a, a small startup, uh, these kind of tools will help you to do that yourself. Um, but certainly, if, if it's detracting from, if you're trying to get new clients and you've got nothing else to do, then, then take a stab at it, you know. I think you can always hire a SEO consultant to do uh, an audit. Uh, an audit is a service that I offer where, you know, I, we can spend, uh, usually it's, it's about three hours total. I, I'll spend a couple hours looking at your site, then we can get on the phone for an hour and go over it and just sort of step through and make sure you're hitting all the marks and then you have a good plan to move forward yourself or you can turn that information over to a developer you're working with and that kind of thing. So uh, it's just, you know, how big your business is and if it's detracting from your time spent doing what you do best, then I would certainly suggest letting a uh, professional SEO person take care of it. And what does an audit typically cost? I mean, they're, they're kind of all over the place. I mean, I, I do an audit on a, on a major corporate website with, you know, maybe a couple million pages could be as much as $10,000. For, um, for a small business, uh, maybe a dentist office that has six pages on the site, we could do, you know, like probably about $500 for a, an audit and, uh, and, and then an hour conversation on the phone to lay out a game plan that's ultimately going to save a ton of time and money. Sure. You know, so, uh, so that's kind of the range. It's quite a big range. But, um, you know, I don't think it always makes sense for small businesses to do ongoing SEO campaigns. Like I work with some big brands, um, you know, on a retainer basis where, it, you know, there's always a lot of stuff to do. There are millions of pages to deal with. But, you know, there's no point in hiring an SEO on retainer to, to look at a six-page site. Um, you know, really your problem there is that you need a lot more content, mm -hmm. you know. And, and you had said one question. You had said early on that you really advised at the very beginning of a website being built. Yep. So there's not a whole lot to audit there, but I assume there are services where you could just team up the developer and give advice on how to construct the page. Yeah, absolutely. I just did something similar to an audit, audit based on a set of mock-ups that I saw. And I was actually able to give quite a bit of guidance because I could see what they were trying to accomplish on the page based on the mock-ups. And, uh, you know, I would look at something and say, this looks like it's kind of an interactive experience. If you're going to, if the programmer is going to do this in JavaScript, there's certain things you have to take into account. Uh, a lot of times, JavaScript, you put it on the page, and if you view the source code of the page, there's, there's, there's no content there. Uh, so JavaScript, for example, shouldn't be used to display content. It should be used as a layer to add maybe some interactive elements to the page, but it shouldn't actually render your content. So those are examples of things that you need to consider in the build process. And then, I'm sorry? I might have mentioned, but are there best keywords? How do you come up, come up with the best keywords? The, the best keywords are going to be the keywords that are aligned with your business goals. And so back when I was talking about the, the buy cycle and how you can target specific points in the buy cycle, to me the best keywords are the keywords where there's a specific intent that you've identified so that when a user does that query, you know that they're very close to completing some goal. But there's somebody else who evaluates what is volumeless. We like these, we see these a lot. Does the number of times a key word, a word is used matter? Yeah, well, it depends on your business model. So I work with some publishers, and volume is almost all that matters because they want as many people viewing their pages as possible because they sell ads on their pages. 
So in that case, intent doesn't really matter as much. They're, they just want a lot of views. So I go for high volume phrases. Thank you. I don't want to take away from the rest of your. I've I've got one more slide. So that that's fine, and I think it's an important an important point. Uh, the, so that's in a publisher model. If you have a business where you sell a product or service, I wouldn't, you know, going for the highest volume. Uh, it might make sense for certain content where if the intent of your content is link bait and you want to get a lot of people to see it and share it and link into it and sort of create that rising tide that lifts all boats, uh, then yeah, go for volume. But on, at a certain point, you want to be funneling that into pages that are based on the action that you hope the user will take. When I say volume, if my business has to do with bees, mm -hmm. but, um, okay, I can talk about bees, I can be, uh, see, natural, but if, people, if search engines aren't interested in bees, I might, would I not get necessarily a high ranking because it's not that important to the rest of the world? Because nobody's searching for bees? Well, if, if there truly is no search volume, then you might not get a lot of traffic. I, I would say with some, a topic like bees, I mean, one of the great things about the internet, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of the long tail. Uh, the long tail, it, on, a, on a graph, it would kind of start up here and then it would go like this. At, at the head uh, of that are all your high volume keywords, but as you move down into the long tail, um, uh, at the front of that you might have cameras, okay? That would be a short head term, if you will. Sure. Then as you move through that long tail, it might be Canon cameras. And uh, as you move further into the long tail, it might be uh, by, uh, I don't know, a, a model, buy Canon um, D50 or, or whatever. Okay. Uh, and so that's a long tail term. If you've got an e-commerce site, you probably want to target that long tail term. If you're a publisher about cameras, you probably want to target the shorter one. Okay. So the point in that, if you have an e-commerce site, I wouldn't burn up a lot of energy chasing the highest volume word because that might get you a lot of useless traffic. Uh, the, the key there is understanding what traffic allows you to accomplish your business goals and target that. That keyword research will give you a lot of content ideas too. Uh, yeah, a related point would be like if you, if you have bees, right? But if you could somehow know that honey actually brings more traffic than the word bee, even if you don't sell honey or whatever, you might mention bees produce honey. So like put the word honey in your content because you know that will bring you traffic. I think there's also maybe a related point there, but then, but how do you know which words bring the most traffic? The keyword tool. The Google's keyword tool will show you global and local search volume. Okay. So I would say, generally speaking, I do like to go for the higher volume. If it's choice between two and the intent behind them is exactly the same, then of course I'm going to go for the higher volume version. Rather besides Google keywords tool, what function is this that? There are a lot of paid tools out there. Um, there's, you know, keyword discovery that, you know, that there's a whole bunch of different tools that if you, uh, if you Google keyword tool, I'm sure you'll find a lot of them. The Google tool, they have probably the best data and it's free. Uh, and like I said, it's becoming part of, you know, absorbed into AdWords, but it's still uh, available and I, it, it breaks down by volume for global and local traffic. And Google Trends does the same thing. You can compare Keyword. If you have two keywords in mind, you can put them in there and see how they compare over time. I wouldn't want you to miss your last slide. Yeah, that's the best one, right? I mean, really, uh, three tips for consistently high rankings. I mean, it's really a summary of everything that we've talked about, but these are the crucial points to keep in mind. If you have a site that you want to get a lot of traffic to, publish great content on a regular basis. I think. If, you're really, if you really don't have a lot of time, I think an initial goal to get started is, is think in terms of like maybe publishing weekly. You know, try to get to that point. Um, where you really want to be is, is if you, depending on how competitive uh, your area is, you might want to publish two to three times a day. I see a lot of marketing agencies and stuff who are part, uh, publishing you know, two, three times every single day and all, all that content's going out there. 
But I think uh, for most small businesses, um, a realistic number is maybe publishing once or twice a week. That, that's a good number to kind of keep your audience engaged with you, getting people to subscribe and, and things like that. Uh, number two, develop an active social media presence and use it to market your content. Um, you know, like I said, there was a time when you could publish content and go out and buy some links, you know, build links, go do a bunch of comment spam and stuff like that, and you could get that content to, to rank. Uh, aside from being a big waste of, of everyone's time, it's not very effective anymore. And one of the best ways you can develop a, a good organic link profile, a natural looking uh, link profile, is to share your content with an engaged audience and they in turn share that with, uh, with people they know and that'll get, you, that'll get you links. And then the last part that's uh, especially important for small businesses and startups is get listed in all the major local search and review directories. Uh, Google Places is, is, should probably be your first stop and make sure that you use a consistent nap. All this work that we do to come up high on the search engine, is that a little bit negated by all this personalization that Google is doing? Like, you know, uh, Facebook's giving you ads just targeted to things you like. Um, so as a business, um, I know you get mostly local stuff first, like in the Google search. Doesn't everybody get a different set of responses when they type something in around the country based on their preferences or their location? Yep. So. And, and that's one of the reasons that, you know, I don't do any kind of, um, I don't do any rank tracking. I, I do, like, aggregate rank tracking, but I'm not the type of SEO company that's going to say, oh, if you come to me and say, I want to rank for this keyword, yeah. and I want you to tell me where I'm positioned every yeah. week or whatever, uh, I'm going to say, I, I can't really help you. I mean, that's because I think you're chasing the wrong goal in that case, yeah. and it's, it's too difficult to track. And, and Google, you know, it's against uh, Google's terms of use to, to scrape their results anyway. So people, there was a big uh, company, it's actually a tool I use called Raven, who offered a link tracking feature, and they were scraping Google's results to, to get that, and G Google cut them off. They're like, you can't do that anymore. And, uh, and I think it's just you're, you're chasing the wrong goal in, in that case. So I, well, local business, I mean, we don't care. We don't want to be your 